Okay, so welcome to the 10th meeting of the DAPS Working Group. Uh, today is the 26th of March, 2024. And this will be the last uh, time this working group meets um, for this quarter. Our goals as a part of this working group are to establish verified retrieval as the norm for retrieving SIDS on the web. As we know, a lot of uh, SIDS and um, IPFS SIDS are, are being used across the web and across uh, web two and web three ecosystems. Um, but a lot of them are using uh, trusted gateways. That is the IPFS.io and just, you know, trusting the gateway to return serialized responses, deserialized responses, that is. Um, and, and so now we're really working to ensure that there's verification end to end, which opens up the window to uh, doing proper peer to peer in dApps and in browsers. Um, and in doing so, we decrease the reliance on these trusted gateways. And potentially we also improve the experience of dApps. Um, this is a broader goal uh, by, by making better tooling, both for the developers and users. So with that, um, it'd be nice to go here over uh, what the concrete goals we had for Q1 were. And please feel, feel free to unmute yourself if you wanna uh, speak to any of these points. I think this is a good time. This is a working group, not me uh, ranting at the microphone. Um, so with that, so we set out to to create this library. Um, I think the name changed a number of times. Like when we set the goal, the name wasn't even this, but we landed on Helia Verified Fetch. And um, Helia Verified Fetch really is trying to emulate, oh, we got to correct this uh, link that we have there. But Helio Verified Fetch is really trying to simulate or to emulate the API of uh, the Fetch API, the web API, that is, where it allows you to take in IPFS URIs, um, that is IPFS colon slash slash, and do all sorts of things, uh, mostly retrieval, uh, but be able to retrieve different types of resources and different type of data um, and have it really work nicely. So, um, where are we today? So, I mean, we wanted to support configurable trustless gateways that we support today already. Um, let me open up the thing and correct the link here. Initially, this was part of the Helium on a repo, but now it's uh, in its own repo. So we do support uh, multiple configurable gateways, trustless gateways, that is. And the cool part there is that you, Helio will actually, the verified fetch will try uh, multiple and will obviously abort um, other gateway requests once one of them responds. Um, and so you get that extra bit of resiliency there. So if one gateway goes down, it can fetch it from others. Um, and uh, you can also use, uh, uh, you can configure the delegated routing HTTP endpoints. Um, at the moment, I should note, uh, while we're, uh, on, re while I'm on record that the delegated routing endpoint is really only used for one thing now, and that is to resolve IPNS names. Um, in the future, we want to lean more heavily into this and actually use that to find multi adders, uh, of peers to do direct retrieval, but, uh, there's, uh, some work that is uh, still ongoing on that uh, with regards to sessions. Um, do you want to speak to that, uh, Russell, maybe where, where things are with direct retrieval and anything else that comes to mind that I may have missed with regards to verified fetch? Um, I think you nailed it. Um, yeah, the idea is basically to um, give users a way in the browser to fetch content from IPFS, but have that content be verified instead of just using, you know, IPFS.io slash IPFS slash CID and getting back some content under the assumption that, you know, we're doing the right thing with hosting IPFS.io, like the trustless gateways in general sort of solve this problem outside of, um, well, they they provide the content, but um, uh, 
yeah, um, the idea is that you would verify that that content is what it says it is on both ends. And like, that's what verified fetch is doing. Uh, yeah. So we have an example, um, an in-browser example that shows some of the ergonomics. And we've also spent quite a bit of time um, making sure that the readme is um, thorough, elaborate, and covers some of the uh, well, many, as many as of the different sort of use cases. And you can see here, you can, you know, configure the, the trustless gateways and um, uh, you can do content type passing and customize the DNS resolvers. Uh, you can work with different uh, IPLD codecs. So it goes into quite a lot of uh, detail and there is a pull request that is almost ready um, to merge. There's still like some final uh, things that need to be resolved there. Um, for the example, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the last thing we had was the aborts that needed to be sorted out. Um, that's actually being resolved now. Um, and, um, I think there's just one test there that needs to, um, to run, um, just need to make sure that all of the tests are running and then we can merge that and then we'll have a nice, uh, runnable, uh, in browser example that is that shows some of the API. Um, maybe now is actually a good... yeah. No, I don't. I don't want to get into this uh, now. But that that's sort of where we are with um, verified fetch. This also sets the foundation for another bit. And there's one last bit. So we said okay. So for, we want to advocate also for verified retrieval, and that includes these docs. Um, so we really put the time, as I mentioned, into the README and that that sort of what we consider docs. There is a blog post coming. Um, it's mostly in my uh, shooting neurons in my brain right now, but there will be a draft coming out uh, uh, tomorrow probably, and. Uh, that will also include uh, a link to the uh, ready to run example. So that's sort of where we are. And now that sort of sets us up for the next thing, which was uh, the service worker gateway. So verified fetch is really useful if you're trying to fetch sort of sub resources, an image or you know, DAG JSON or just JSON that is being stored on IPFS. Um, but if you want to start loading dApps, this is where we get into the service worker gateway. And um, the service worker gateway, I feel like uh, if you've attended this before, then you're probably familiar with this, but the service worker gateway attempts to do what a, an IPFS gateway does, but do it in the browser. So instead of trusting the gateway, you're actually just, you're doing the verification. So you don't need to trust um, a, an external sort of server to be returning the right responses. It does sort of rely on, um, on verified fetch, but it uses a service worker as a means of handling all of the nuances of loading dApps in the browser. And this is quite a heroic effort. Um, it's a lot of work that went into making this work. And um, yeah, I think uh, the TLDR is that like we're getting very close and um, uh, things are looking pretty good. Um, but we are still sort of hammering out a lot of like last, uh, details. Um, the idea is that this would be deployed to in browser dot link. So you would be able the same way that you do, uh, dweb dot link, you would be able to use in browser dot link. And, uh, you would be able, let's say loading Vitalik's website. Okay. Yeah, I think there's currently an issue with that Helia service worker redirect okay. handling. So if you type the the URL and the the browser directly, it'll right. Um, okay. Vitalik, Vitalik dash, dash dash just one dash. Okay, right. Um dot IPNS dot in browser link. Yeah. Yeah, and there's some some DNS issues that that we're resolving with that. With, but, but yeah, if you run this locally, it's working really well. I think there's just some issues with um, our infrastructure for this um, static site. Yeah. Okay. 
um, I put a link to the uh, productionization issue. And so that we created this a little over a month ago, and you can already see that a lot of these things have actually been resolved. So that's just to speak to some of the uh, progress we've made. This is obviously uh, some, you know, UX uh, porcelain layer um, polishing that we will do, but we're really trying to get it to work before we make it beautiful. Um, is there anything you want to speak to, to some of the things you've been working on, uh, Russell? I, we can actually get nitty gritty into the details. I think, you know, this is a forum where it's, you know, we can use this valuable time also to discuss some of the problems uh, we've been hitting. So anyways, I'll, I'll hand it to you. One one thing I do want to note because I it's uh, fresh in my mind and I have been working on it um, is uh, this bug that was reported. So we had this, uh, we saw a lot of requests uh, going out to do the resolution the DNS resolution, the DOH, DNS over HTTP. And um, I tested this with the latest version, I believe, with well, with in-browser dev. And I also saw that it's still sending out a lot of these uh, requests. Um, anyways, I uh, looked into this and I've submitted a pull request. Um, and yeah, basically what, what was happening, it was like the main thing that we were the main, like the main source of the bug that was that we were uh, setting the uh, TTL for the TLRU cache in seconds, even though it was expecting milliseconds. So it's really just getting cached for milliseconds rather than the seconds as it was supposed to based on the mm -hmm. TTL value. Anyways, I added some tests for this and that's the pull request, but I'll go back to this and I'll hand it over to you. Um, Sweet, that's awesome. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, there's, there's, um, you know, it's been working fairly well, uh, when running locally or when, um, deploying the assets just by themselves, I've been deploying them to sw.sergeantpookie.com, um, just with a basic Nginx server, um, Nginx reverse proxy in front of it. So it can like map the subdomain requests to that same set of assets. Um, and it's got a wildcard cert. So the origin isolation works and everything. Um, but what there's a issue for minimal end to end tests that I've been working on just this past week. And I've got, um, it's locally now I've got the gateway conformance fixtures loading and a, and a, local Kubo gateway um, instantiating. So we're not in our end to end tests querying, uh, you know, the trustless gateway dot link. Um, just fleshing out like how that code works and how test writing will work right now. But um, it's, it's passing, uh, you know, all the tests as far as like, when you request, if you host this site on a domain that does have the reverse proxy that can redirect subdomains to to the main domain, um, the, it tests that it does redirect correctly. Um, it tests the range requests, uh, which with Playwright, it's hard to do that um, like as like a request, especially because the server is in a service worker. Um, so you have to actually do a page evaluate in the page to do a byte request. So that's that's working and it's returning only the expected bytes using the um, some of the fixtures from the gateway conformance tests that are missing blocks and that's returning successfully. Um, I think it's 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 working really well. I think we just need to um, just fix some of the the DNS and the hosting issues with the in browser.dev and in browser.link. And I'm I'm pretty happy with where it's at. There there are still some edge cases, some minor things that'll take, you know, maybe a day to fix a a group of them in that in that like productionization one, like the URL encoded um names. Um and the like some other things like that like basic things that'll that should be fixed very quickly um but just recently i updated the service worker gateway to pass just it it, it doesn't do any additional like url parsing or anything special it just passes that directly to verified fetch 
And then yeah, yeah, by absolutely. passing uh, redirect to manual, um, we get back a 301 if if like the IPFS gateway thing we're supposed to do for, for a directory is supposed to have a trailing slash and the original request didn't have it and other things like that. So like it's, it's you know, goes to show that verified fetch is you know, working really well. Um, what else have I been working on? Um, there was some speed up improvement. So like last week, I um, it was really bugging me that trying to load Big Buck Bunny with the service worker gateway would kind of just stall for a long time. And like it it looked like the request was waiting and like fetching the entire content and then byte range requests could like skip you ahead but you already downloaded all the content so like what's you know it wasn't really giving us any benefit and now um it'll basically return and give you time to time to interactive of six seconds or less less on a kubo node that does not have that content at all um so basically it fetches the blocks and then returns those to you. And um, as soon as it can, like as soon as it returns those first bytes to the browser and says that it supports range requests, the browser uh, besides Safari, it does work in Chrome and, and Firefox. Um, the browser will say, okay, well, we know this is a video. We know the content type is, you know, whatever. And it supports range requests. So I'm going to be like, start showing my native browser video player and then do range requests and you can skip ahead you can skip all the way to the end and then that loads almost instantly like it's it's really great i'm really happy about about that yeah i was like hoping maybe maybe i can get like a demo working but uh, there's like I, I just tried the subdomains and like it's uh, in browser.dev is giving me some issues with the subdomains if you run it locally it'll it'll it works. Yeah, really well. yeah, yeah. I'm running it locally now. Um, so dot there we go. Helia dot ipfs dot helia service worker dot. It's logs. just running on localhost. You should be able to just run it there. All right. Or unless that's this is the that's your proxy. Big buck bunny. Oh, bam! And there we go. It's so fast. And like you can do a make temp or like set IPFS path to make temp, blah, blah, blah. And then do, NP, you know, Kubo init um, and then Kubo daemon start on a fresh, um, you know, Kubo instance. And, and it'll still do the same, which, you know, uh, the way what that's proving is that like that Kubo node does not have all those blocks. So you're not going to, you know, you're not going to get all those blocks in, in, you know, 172 megabytes in six seconds. Um, but yeah, yeah. Zoom. Zoom is making the get video skip a tiny bit, but, but yeah, it's awesome. Oh, I, I just paused it actually, but uh, so, so actually Chrome shows uh, uh, the, um, how much of it has been already uh, preloaded? Yep. And so if I skip ahead, and obviously it's already showing that it's sort of doing the range request successfully, but if I sort of skip ahead, this is pretty cool. Wow. Even though it's interesting, it's still getting a lot of 504s. Yeah, I try to, when I'm testing locally, just so I don't bombard the post it, you know, the trustless gateway dot link. I usually use my local Kubo, my local right, gateway. Right. Yeah. Also, um, 504s are not something uh, uh, you should like, worry about. It's because the current tr throttling limits are tied to the serialized responses. So kind of like you make a request, you get a video back. But when you, and, and there's like a limit of 15 requests per second from a single IP or something like that. Uh, but if you like fetch block multiple blocks, you you instantly run over that. Uh, but wouldn't that uh, be four two nines? Yeah, so that, that you that's would that. get. Yeah, that's that plus uh, there are multiple instances in a single pop, and uh, we are not routing to the same pop uh, that you had success before. Oh yeah. Uh, so true. the assumption is, 
it's kind of like like this like when you load that index html all the assets on the page which are loaded from the same directory should instantly load right you should not have a situation when oh i loaded the first uh like frame of the video but the the later frames are now uh slow because my gateway is not able to find them um and that's the situation we are in uh, but that's more specific to trustless uh, gateway uh, link uh, optimization that specific gateway instance and it's also like why the, the there's like a huge value of a service worker gateway in a regular gateway you don't control from where the gateway fetches blocks you don't control which DNS server is used for DNS link resolution. You don't control the, the how the routing looks like. In service worker gateway, you can literally like replace everything. Uh, so if the trust has, uh, if it's, right now we have a single gateway, but the idea is that now you can fetch from multiple gateways and now you, you, you don't hit those like limitations and you are not, uh, that's why like running local Kubo works better than. Yeah, can, do you mind if we quickly do that? Uh, I will share my screen for the moment. The so one thing I want to say that Lytle just said is that you can customize like everything with the service worker gateway. Right now, if you look at the config on Daniel's page, um, it just has the gateways and routers. Uh, the DNS resolvers are not listed there right now. They will be um, at some point. Um, and then this this config uh, is global too. So you can set this config at your root. And when you load a new subdomain, it converses via iframe to load that same config on on your subdomains. So so it's sharing. Um, what was yeah. the what were some of the commands to clear to like create a new Kubo profile? Um, I put it. Let me let me get the um, let me get it real quick. Uh, I have a NPX command I can get to you real quick. Uh, okay. I love running arbitrary NPX commands. <laughs> okay, let me see. Uh, export, blah, 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 blah. Okay, here we go. <laughs> export IPFS path, make temp dash D, NPX kubo init. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm using fish, so. Um, Ah, okay, okay, okay. I think I can just do that. It's got a trailing, um, trailing. I do have Kubo. Little tilde you might want to remove from your command. Trailing oh yeah, I see that. There you go. Oh yeah. Um, and it's changing the address to 8081 because I'm using 8080. So you might want to, yeah. Also, I, I don't use the IPFS command at all. I use NPX Kubo now for everything. And then your port, you'll want to change it to 8081 or. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll just make sure I don't have it running on another. Should be gone. Okay, we should be good. All right, so it's running here and I'll change the port here to 81. Okay, I'll save that. And then I'll clear, I'll clear the uh, site data here. So if I reload the big buck bunny thing, first we'll, we'll look at the config, that's correct. That's great. Um, and we'll load the content. Okay. Oh, I think I may have, mistakenly no what's going on live demo <laughs> second okay and uh all right let's give it another do i need to put http maybe okay Load content. Ah, oh, that's weird. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, it's getting an error from the service worker. Interesting. Okay, that seems to be fine. All right, it's already getting the block, and you can see it's getting it. From 
from the local one and bang we're good to go that's pretty nice um let's you can just, just skip the, the end real quick in that video yeah Keep ahead okay you can already see it's getting those blocks that i guess are necessary for that range more opening here just to see the peers yeah the zoom buffering doesn't help display it but but the first the first pop in showed pretty quickly which was nice yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah ideally before we announce this like to the wider realm all of like all, uh, daniel's demo right there would be you know would have worked flawlessly um you know the the loading whatever the 502 cause was like we're gonna we're working on fleshing those things out and and really polishing things up cool well, i guess the cool thing here is that all of this is cat well i mean now it's cached local by the kuba node um we don't actually cast the range requests uh we could potentially introduce like a, a block, uh, like an index DB block uh, store, and then we would have the blocks. I think, well, yeah. That what happens? That. So what's what's cool about the service worker in Helia Verified Fetch is that it's using a memory data store, and so as Helia fetches that from the back end gateway, even if it's not cached in the browser, the Helia instance that is used by your your service worker um should have that content or at least we can use indexed db memory data stores so that that will be true in the future um the cache the in memory won't if your service worker goes idle but but yeah if we want to yeah that, i think we we're like playing that also that trade-off game right with a cache api which we use for like full responses so it's like anyways um one thing I wanted to ask and sort of open this question more broadly is whether at some point, I mean, especially if we're going to have a blog post for verified fetch, um, I want to mention the service worker API, uh, the service worker gateway as one of the projects that we're working on. Um, and I'm wondering if that's the kind of thing where instead of like fully productionized and ready to go, we invite people for like, um, early access or share it as, as something that is in preview mode. I don't know if we've done something like this in, because, you know, it obviously invites a lot of feedback um, and it might be too early because we know that there's a lot of things that need to be polished, but um, I wonder if there is a certain threshold that we pass and we're like, okay, this is ready for some broader testing and we want to get more feedback. We, we know it's not production ready, but we want to get this into that people. Um, and so I, I have that in mind as something that I want to call out, but for me at the very least, we need to have um, the, uh, uh, the DNS link problems resolved with in browser dot link until then, like I, I wouldn't even bother. But I'm curious, what would your bar be for like sharing this um, in the blog post as something that is ready in preview or like in, in social media of uh, like the IPFS social media? I'm asking also because Dame is here and I think this is a pretty big deal, but we don't also don't want to like um, set too high expectations. So I think having the preview or early access, whatever label or like whatever tag we land on is a good way to sort of reduce that sort of high expectations risk that could arise for me i think uh you know i i think like this sw.sergeantpookie.com works fairly well but you know that's not a, a domain that is owned by the team you know that's my personal sort of testing uh deployment um and so once i think once we get in browser.dev working really well and consistently um, we we should try to invite some folks to to test on that. That is like the nightly. That is where the the changes to service worker gateway go um, on merges to main. 
so you know we would we would surface that with like hey this you know this is getting live updates active um frequent updates okay so it sounds like for us it's okay as long as we got the initial payload like the loader is loading and the dns link resolution is happening stay like consistently and reliably enough i i'd, I'd probably want to have like a set of there a set of you know things that we've checked you know a set of links that we've checked out that seem reasonable that we expect to load correctly like the vast majority of the time right not saying 100% of the time because we're we don't need to get to 100% to get people to start hammering on it right but like if there's a particular type of website that only that you know frequently runs into problems then probably we don't tell people to hammer on that but there should be some subset of things where we like are like very confident should work most of the time as sanity checks for people because if you're not there if you don't have basic sanity checks there's no point in anyone hammering on it yeah because you already know right yeah um, so i've actually added this table here to the productionizing issue for the service worker gateway where I have, you know, the IPFS docs, I have the CID um, tool that we have, uh, Uniswap interface and Wikipedia on IPFS. I think these are four that are decent to start with, but I think I would probably extend to have some IPNS. I would add one. I would add a DNS link. You know, we have the IPNS ones. I would add one with ENS. I would, you know, if we feel confident adding one with a video, then we'd add one with a video, right? um yeah with and with if, if one of them feels like it's too much right if we're like okay actually by the time we figure out rate limits you know it'll take it'll be too annoying to figure out the rate limits to make the video things happy right now then fine so we don't put that one up there as the sanity check and then we make sure that's filed as an issue so people know when they run into it that this is something that is already known um so they don't have to go and refile an issue. And then when they discover new things, which is part of the hammering on it, is both get people, like, get people's feedback and see what they're excited about, but also to, like, tell us when they're, you know, hammer on things and 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 find some of the edge cases we haven't found yet. I think one, one thing that we should do, too, once we get these end-to-end -end tests working well is... Um, run playwright tests against the in browser dot dev um to to ensure that that's working and that that you know can be our sanity tests on the deployed version um that should run after every uh push to main like maybe once an hour or something or maybe i mean we don't even need to do that after it pushes to main after it updates to in browser dot dev we should um, after some time, run a test against it, whatever time to propagate. Yeah, that sounds good because that would be a good sort of indicator where we can point and be like, okay, we're comfortable with this. All right. And, and that sounds like that would be probably a couple more weeks out before we're like, we can. All right. Yeah. No, no strict timelines here, but, um, that's good to know. Okay. Um, I think that's a good moment now to move on to the last topic that we have today, and that is um, the uh, spec that uh, you've been working on, Lidl, or as Cameron likes to call you, Liddell. Uh, this is kind of related to uh, the thing I hinted before, um, a service worker gateway giving uh, end user ability to control where the blocks come from. Uh, the the first milestone is to fetch from uh, trustless gateways. And right now, all our like demos just fetch from a single endpoint. But the idea is that you will have a list of gateways, a uh, list of HTTP endpoints from where you can get blocks. And you are no longer like tied to one gateway giving you five or fours. Uh, I think maybe that's also like a, one of things we want to do before we ask people for feedback to have like more than one host name there and also have uh, a local host one. Because if you have Kubo running locally, you should like leverage that, uh, right? Uh, who knows where the service worker gateway is deployed, but if you have a local uh, endpoint, why not? 
um, especially for testing, I think it would be useful to uh, for maximizing signal to noise ratio of the feedback from people. Once we ask people for feedback for, for the alpha like version of uh, the service worker gateway, we don't want to have like bug reports about uh, like IPFS IO gateway being like slow to resolve or being overwhelmed at a certain times on certain uh, uh, regions. What we want, we want to have uh, feedback about the service worker gateway, not like correctly resolving some uh, new XFS yeah. paths or something like that, right? So I think uh, um, the problem when you have more than one gateway is that when you have like fetching bl blocks from multiple sources, um, you lose that uh, value when you ask for a, a root document. Uh, your, your IPFS node connects to the provider of that node. And then you ask for some sub resources, which are under the same like root. And you are already connected to a person that has it. So you don't need to do the content uh, lo routing lookups anymore. You effectively, like you already are connected to the good source and you fetch everything from the same source. You fetch the, the main page or the main directory. The problem is like, if you now are, trying to spread and fetch all this image, this asset from a different gateway or a part of the blocks from one or another, you make a request for block to a IPFS node, which just is not connected to a provider or maybe even it's not able to find that block because it's like internal block, which was not announced anywhere. So uh, this IP uh, proposes an optional header that uh, HTTP client sending requests for blocks or cars to trustless gateways. Uh, those clients could add this header with information about, okay, I'm fetching this block in the context of this content path, right? So I'm fetching this image, uh, uh, this block, and it's a part of an image on this Wikipedia page. And that gives a gateway ability to uh, one, maybe speed up resolution and two, and if it's not able to find providers for that block, it's able to like find a provider for that parent uh, thing, which may be may have more providers uh, uh, in general. Um, yeah, and the idea is that service worker gateway would be sending this hint to other gateways, um, and gateways over time will opportunistically act on it. It could be acting if it's not able to find providers, or it may. F try to pre-connect to them uh, in parallel. Uh, there's a very, very basic a very, a very, and very blunt implementation for a Boxo Gateway li library. But uh, if we have it there, then we can have it on in Rainbow. We can have it in uh, most of the gateways um, that are in in, in the production. Um, so the details and like more fleshed out rationale why. And uh, it's on the IPIP, but uh, I think that's the, the summary of the value. And the value is that like, people should not be punished for using more than one trustless gateway as a backend of service worker gateway. It should be, uh, uh, it should give you better performance, not worse, right? I haven't looked at the um at I, I saw Henrik did uh an initial initial uh, attempt at this one. What's the thought what how are you thinking about um whether the path affinity is like whether the affinity is related to like the specific path or like the greater resource thing that you're looking at? So for example, um let's say you had a website that had links to other websites but that weren't inside of the same graph right so uh the libp2p docs website links to the main libp2p site and the other way around but they're they're not in one big dag right so would 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 you have the requests say, that come through the service worker be tagged with like the root of the request even if the thing went outside of the graph right so you would ask a request for docs 
for docs.libp2p.io, even when you were asking for the libp2p.io um, resources? Yeah, so, uh, so it's a good question. So there's like a logical parent. In the context of uh, like websites, you, you got the parent document and you got sub resources and those sub resources could be loaded from a different origin than the, the main document. Um, so that's partially why in this uh, IPIP, it's allowed to have more than one hint of the path affinity. I don't expect it to be used often, but for example, if you know that, oh, I'm, uh, there's this image which is loaded from a different origin than the top document. And my I'm loading that through, through Service Worker Gateway. Uh, that translates to a request to a content path or, or, or HTTP request, which is like from a different origin, which is like a different uh, DAG. Because effectively, you can think about in the IPFS context, every different origin on a gateway means a different DAG. Uh, a different parent DAG. So the idea is that if you have an image which was not on the in the same directory as the main document that triggered the request, uh, the affinity path would be, uh, and that image is consists of multiple blocks. So requests for each block of that image would have a path based on the address of the image from a different origin. So that's like the default, the, the default mode in my mind is that you use, you, you, I'm fetching an image, I'm fetching an asset, I'm using its URL as a source of the affinity hint first. And then if I have additional information that like, oh, a service worker uh, may know that, oh, this image also was loaded in the context of, of this other page, you can use the other pages if that's also like on IPFS path as a second hint. It's not or. The thing is like the default would be you'd use uh, the affinity of the, uh, the entity you are loading. So you would care more about the image, the URL of the image rather than the page you are loading it from because you have no guarantee the parent is on the same origin. But that's why we allow more than one hint here. And I, I don't think more, so for example, like service worker gateway will have information to be able to send both, but many clients will only be able to send uh, one, which is just a, a hint based on the URL of the, uh, the asset itself without the context of the page it's loaded from. Not sure if that helps, I apologize, but maybe like a, a explanation on the issue uh, uh, on the IP was better, if not, uh, just comment, I'll write maybe like a better explanation. I think it makes sense. I mean, right, for the most part, right, the affinity stuff is, it should be optional with yeah. it maybe ending up being a little more required if you are asking for a resource that nobody would reasonably expect, expect to be independently addressable, which would be like, you know, two, you know, one megabyte inside the middle of like a one gigabyte zip file or you know tar file at least zip files you can ask for the middle of and decompress them individually but tar files you can't even tar gz's you can't even do that so you know a one megabyte thing in the middle of a tar gz probably does not need to be independently addressable um but yeah. for for anything that someone might reasonably expect to be independently addressable the affinity should be not required and so these are just extra hints and you're like, okay, there's room for multiple hints. So that seems, that seems fine by me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another, maybe like example, I just uh, like remember is, um, uh, web, um, web recorder had a, a, a nice spec. Let me find it. <laughs> okay. Here it is. Um, so for example, the tar, like compressed tar, maybe not be the best example, but uh, well, it's let's a say zip. Un that one's better. Yeah, and yeah, uncompressed zip, it makes a nice container. So in this context, yeah, just like you said, like uh, inside of a uh, web archive, you may have images and HTML files, which you want to, them to be like addressable on, the, on their own, right? So they will, 
kind of like have their own. Um, you expect them to be announceable, but then in the context of uh, of some other uh, page load, it could you would not have that information, right? Um, so even though you have something that that is like a, an individually addressable, you some clients will still like want to send a hint because uh, it does not hurt, right? It's like an op additional information for the gateway, and the gateways are not uh, forced to act on it, but it does not hurt to have that. Oh, Daniel, you're muted. Is there anything else you want to discuss with regards to path affinity? I I don't think so. It's kind of like fairly small and well scoped because there, there's like a, the more, uh, the, you know, for security reasons and in that spec, we suggest to limit to three, like the gateway should not act on infinite number of things because that's like a de denial of service vector or like just yeah. spamming vector. Um, uh, there is an uh, another, there was like a, a, another ask to have like a pure affinity, <laughs> which is more uh, even bigger denial of service vector when you say, hey, this person surely has this content. And uh, I explicitly did not include that as a because it could be the same like uh, IP, but I did not include it because I feel that's like requires more, uh, more, more uh, uh, conscious uh, design around. Uh, yeah, just don't if clients start start uh, spamming uh, peer, some peer IDs, you can uh, have a denial of uh, like DDoS someone this way, uh, but. Here we just pass a path, and with things like content routing, delegated content routing, and multiple routing systems, that kind of like the idea is that this spreads uh, the load. You don't point at a specific provider. Uh, but if you're like a website, and uh, let's say you are building an app, and that app is fetching uh, blocks from uh, trustless gateways, uh, you may have always pass like a DNS link of your own infrastructure. Um, as affinity and people who resolve that affinity uh, kind of like as a hint to, for, to gateway and um, because you you p you may be pinning assets of your app um, but you don't want to like un announce all of them uh, and you use this as a shortcut because you, you you have like your you announce your providers uh, via DNS link because the content path it could be like IPFS or IP IPNS uh, in the proof of concept I implemented, we just don't care. If it's IPNS, we resolve it. Um, so there, there are some like open questions. Uh, what, where the anti-pattern starts, <laughs> where the future ends. Uh, but I feel for the purpose of the service worker gateway, we effectively just use, use the path of the asset, uh, use that as a hint, because it may be just an internal block of some bigger file, and that's it. So yeah, if anyone has a feedback uh, on it, uh, uh, please comment on the IP, but that's about it. Cool. Um, one thing I, I thought would be just a, a different and unrelated topic would be to discuss um, briefly some of the caching strategies that we have for IPNS and DNS link. So we have this uh, pull request inside uh, Helia. Well, inside Helia IPNS that adds, uh, well, support for this no cache option um, to IPNS. And I realized when I was, uh, so this, this is specific to IPNS names, but I realized when looking at some of the um, IPNS, uh, Helia IPNS code bases that we don't actually have any caching for um, DNS link. So when we do DNS link resolution, we don't actually um, 
it doesn't seem like we're caching it. I might be wrong about this. Like we, we do have the option here to do no cache, but if you actually look um, around, it's not being used. So for example, the resolve DNS link is literally just calling the, um, well, it's calling, I should open it locally, but uh, from what I understand, there is no caching being done um, inside the, inside the Helia IPNS um, um, package, which means that it's nice that in verified fetch, we have this, this uh, least, least, uh, least recently used um, cache, but uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if we probably, it seems like we probably want to add uh, caching, either use the block store, uh, sorry, the data store also for DNS uh, records. Um, yeah, so the, the prior art from the go side is we have uh, like a kind of like a global uh, cache for um, all mutable pointers. So that applies to both DNS link and IPNS uh, records. Yeah. In both cases, you got a concept of TTL. So yeah. both uh, DNS TXT record or IPNS record has a, have a TTL field and that uh, acts a hint for a caching system. So what we have in Boxo, uh, in Boxo namesys, uh, we have a cache and we, we just cache based on the TTL and on, up to the point of the TTL, we don't look for an update at all, right? So that saves us on, especially like if you have a page and it has a multiple uh, like assets and every asset is loaded through IPNS DNS link, you resolve the same DNS link like dozen of hundreds of times uh, during the single page load, uh, which is probably fine as long as your DNS over HTTPS endpoint has cache control set correctly, but still, right? Um, so I, my suggestion would be to adopt something similar for both DNS link and uh, IPNS records have a uh, cache for mutable pointers. Um, you can cap. Uh, you can you, you can cap it uh, at the bottom. <laughs> cap it at the bottom. You can limit it at the bottom um, in that in the sense that you don't you you if the TTL is lower than one minute, you still want to cache up for a minute um, yeah. because people will want to uh, like whistle <laughs> uh, out uh, close to real time updates. But uh, but yeah. Uh, that's about it. Um, there's, I linked a code from the uh, Go side, but that would be my suggestion. Um, and make that default, right? We don't want people to be in the running without cache. It should, it should, there should be like a flag for like disabling it, but um, there's also like uh, maybe a good uh, uh, information about like configuration for the cache. One thing is the ability to disable it. And the second one is to also um, control the ceiling of the TTL. Because uh, we've had a situation when people have been publishing records with TTL set to two days. And then other people in community saying that, oh, IPNS is slow. <laughs> It yeah. takes forever for updates to propagate. Well, you published the with TTL set to like 48 hours or 24 hours, right? Um, so we have uh, a configuration option in Kubo for capping uh, the ceiling of the TTL. So even though someone had a record uh, with TTL higher than like an hour or 24 hours or 48 hours, uh, you don't cache for longer. Um, so usually like the bottom is hard coded to one minute, but the ceiling, um, there's like some uh, default, which is 48 hours makes sense in context of Amino DHT. Amino DHT records expire around that. So that's 
saying uh, implicit default, but you may want also want to expose it if people want to like. Uh, they want other people's content to load faster. Right? Well, that's uh, EOL, right? Like it makes sense for the amino DHT records to have EOLs that are like forty eight hours because you're gonna have to republish anyway. But you may still want the TTLs to be much shorter, like yeah. The, if you're, you know, you may still want them to be like five minutes if you think you're realistically that's how that's how long your tolerance is on updates, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that totally makes sense. And um, it goes both ways too, right? Like as a client, you're going to set like the the TTL that the 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 EOL is, is more of like a statement of, of of validity that you should more closely obey uh as a client but the ttl is much more advisory right like if if you say that the ttl is like one second i may choose to cache for five minutes because i'm not gonna do a query every second yeah, yeah. for the same record and if you say your ttl is 48 hours i'll be like i know you said that but all my users are going to yell at me so i've decided it's now five minutes uh or, right. after, or whatever yeah no totally i i see i see the point you're making there um, just to add that comment there. All right. Um, I think we're at time, so I'll stop sharing. Uh, thank you all for coming and, uh, chatting and hanging out. Um, yeah, I think we have the colo. Um, I'm not sure if I'll be joining for that, but, uh, um, yeah. See you soon. See you.